Hello and welcome to the Sunday discussion, everybody. All right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about Nietzsche. Um, we're going to mainly be talking about his concept of the Ubermensch, the Superman, uh, also sometimes translated as the Overman, interestingly enough. Um, did everybody get a chance to go through the videos? I went through yeah. a couple, yeah. Yeah, cool. There were a bunch of short ones, and then there was a really long one that was... The long one was kind of dense. It was some pr very dense philosophy, so I don't blame you guys if you didn't get to that one. Um, okay, so a brief understanding of Nietzsche. He was born in 1844 in East Germany. Uh, his father was a priest, and so he grew up in a pretty religious household. He was really, really good at school and became a professor uh, in his mid-20s on ancient Greek philosophy. Um, he, he kind of hated school. He didn't really like the academics. He thought everybody was too stiff and unyielding, and then moved to the Swiss Alps, where he basically created all of his work that we all know today. Um, at 44, he had a mental breakdown from uh, effects of syphilis, which is an STD that kind of eats at your brain, and never really recovered from that. Um, he hated his family. His family is a big reason he's often misunderstood because his sister and her husband were very pro-Nazis, and so they took a lot of his work and edited in a bunch of anti-Semitism, uh, so he is often considered a Nazi philosopher, but he's not really. Uh, it was just his shitty sister. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he has a few big ideas. Uh, the Ubermensch is what we're mostly going to focus on today, but there's a few others where we got um, God is Dead is another big one that you guys have probably heard many times before. This comes up in pop culture a lot. Um, another one that I didn't, I wasn't really aware of is that he believed we should never drink alcohol. He was very anti-religion and very anti-alcohol. He said there have been two great narcotics in Western civilization, Christianity and alcohol. And he said that was because both of them tend to numb pain and uh, reassure us that things are fine. They stop us from improving our lives, getting valuable things done. Um, a great quote from one of these videos was, how little you know of human happiness, you comfortable people. The secret of a fulfilled life is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then, uh, so yeah, we've got, uh, God is dead, the Ubermensch, um, don't drink alcohol, and um, own up to envy is the way that one video put it, but really a big part of this was embracing the void, embracing nihilism, um, and I think this goes into duality a lot, and we can really play a lot with comparing this to Taoism, because he believed that to ignore the dark side of humanity and nihilism and the void was to live in a superficial world. Um, it was to, to ignore life completely because life had to have these things and that you had to embrace uh, nihilism in order to go beyond it and become the ubermensch, uh, your best possible self. Um, let's see here. So I'll probably just start with the Academy of Ideas videos. Uh, this is one of my favorite YouTube channels and they are great. Um, I think that guy's Canadian. He sounds kind of Canadian. And um, so we'll start with, let's see, we'll start with Thus Book Zarathustra. This is where the Ubermensch idea comes into play in this book. This is a great book. Um, Zarathustra is a man who decides to leave uh, civilization and go and live on a mountain and he he just lives there for like I forget decades or something and then he's he has this revelation where he speaks to the Sun and he says um, what would your happiness be if not for those whom you shine so he feels uh, and this is very conceited he feels kinda like he is the Sun and what why do I have this wisdom if not to share it with other people so he decides to descend back into civilization 
Uh, the first person he comes across is an old man, and the old man sees him coming down from this mountain and says, What business do you have with mankind? And Zarathustra says, I love mankind, and I'm bringing this gift of wisdom to them. And the old man says, They're going to reject you. They're going to spurn you. They're not going to want this. And he is totally optimistic and doesn't believe it. And so he comes into town and he sees there's a crowd gathered to watch a tightrope walker. But the tightrope walker hasn't started yet, so there's just a crowd in front of a stage. So he decides, oh, this is perfect for me. And he gets on stage and he starts speaking to the crowd. And he starts telling them about this idea. And he says, um, the Superman... Uh, is what we all basically need to turn into, that we are what he calls the last man now. And just like our previous ape ancestors became the man we are now, we are the apes that will then become the Superman in the future. Uh, another translation is the overman, because uber apparently also can mean over. And so it's kind of stepping over where we are now and going into... Um, our best possible existence. Um, <clears throat> he really embraces the concept of will in this. Um, he believes that the church was fighting passion. Uh, basically the church wanted to kill the concept of passion and have you live humbly and uh, and he thought that passion and will uh, had to be embraced. And the church, one thing that he wanted the church to do was deify craving. Uh, basically make holy the instinct in us that wants to overcome ourselves and evolve. The force of aspiration. Uh, if we embrace aspiration, we can become our best self. Um, he said, an attack on the roots of passion is an attack on the roots of life. So he was very much about embracing this uh, spark and energy. Uh, another famous quote of his is that one must have chaos in one to give birth to a dancing star. So you might say this is where we kind of contrast with Zen a little bit because a lot of Buddhism seems like you want to have peace within you and not have chaos. And he believed that if we sought only peace and rejected the dark abyss chaos side of us, um, we would make that dark abyss stronger and that it would eventually overwhelm us and that we would lose any sense of purpose or will in life. He really did believe a lot in the purpose of life. So the tightrope walker uh, becomes an analogy in this book where he says the we are the tightrope walker between our animal self and our superman um, and the rope is over the abyss and we are trying to balance between the two which I think is very psychological uh, one thing that Nietzsche did was influence heavily Freud uh, Carl Jung and uh, who is the third guy, uh, Alfred Adler. So these three kind of titans of psychology, he um, influenced them. And I think that id, ego, superego was a big concept that uh, Freud especially got out of this, uh, this tightrope walking, this um, the ape man, the last man, and the superman. Um, three tiers of our conscious existence. Um, so m he says current society, he talks a lot about current society, and I think a lot of what he says applies even greater to where we are now. Uh, I'll go into that. Um, so he says that current society, uh, we live, we are the last man. Uh, we specialize in consumption, not creation. Our self-infatuation conceals underlying resentment. The last man, uh, 
has a lot of pleasures and comforts, but he has no struggle. He is therefore empty and miserable because he has no pain and struggle to use to overcome himself. And you have to use that pain in order to go through it and become your better self. I thought that was a really fascinating point. Um, in the utopia of the last man, no one would struggle. Uh, and therefore no one would ever overcome themselves. Uh, everybody would all want the same things and the utopia would just be kind of a dead circle maintaining itself without going anywhere. And of course, so he, Zarathustra says all these things in this book to this crowd and they all laugh at him like the old man said they would and he he feels saddened by this he he feels rejected so he decides that this gift of wisdom isn't just for a crowd of people because people won't get it it's gotta just be for um, a select few individuals with potential who want to follow themselves and then there's this imagery at the end of the book that is really really good and I think is also very Taoist um, it's an eagle flying that's being strangled by a snake and Zarathustra sees this um, and at first he thinks it's being strangled but then he realizes the snake is just riding on the eagle and they're flying together and that's his analogy for what we must do is we must take our abyss, our snake, and ride with it or else it will strangle us. Um, and this means acknowledging our capacity for evil. He said, the higher you climb, the more strongly the roots dive downward into the dark and the depths. So, yeah, Zarathustra, good book. Um, Let's see, the other Academy Ideas video was about how to become who you are, same concept. Let's see here. So Nietzsche said, people have a fear of exploring the depths of themselves psychologically. They have a fear of the abyss and they try to ignore it or reject it. And people get held up on all of this. Uh, he was very influenced by Heraclitus, Nietzsche was. So Heraclitus is quoted in this video as saying, if you went in search of it, it being yourself or the soul, you would not find the boundaries of the soul. Uh, though you traveled every road, uh, so deep is its measure. So Nietzsche was asking, um, how can we know ourselves? How can a human know itself? Um, we are dark and veiled on many different levels. I think at one point in this video he says if you stripped away 57 levels you would still not be at the core of your true self. Um, you cannot really point to the source or true nature of yourself but you can go deeper. Uh, he said that most people live on very shallow levels and uh, a voluntary descent into the mind may induce temporary or even permanent madness because the mind is like a labyrinth. There are multiple dangers and it's hard to see how and where you lose your way. Um, greater depths equals higher degree of turmoil. Uh, this is the void that Nietzsche was talking about. Um, we are driven inward to impose order on the chaos of our inner psyche. We want harmonious totality and so we impose form and discipline on this inner chaos and we create ourselves not out of nothing um, but out of our inner chaos and order imposed upon it. Uh, and this is why he believed that God was dead because people were no longer getting that inner order on chaos from religion. Uh, the moral um, laws that were coming from, down from religion have no meaning and have no life and spirit to them so people feel empty inside and uh, it's not that Nietzsche killed God it's that all of us killed God because it means nothing to us anymore and he's of course talking about traditional Christianity um, when he's talking about this uh, any thoughts so far from anyone? 
I have some. Yeah, what do you think? So, I was, um, I just want to emphasize on the thought that, um, I believe you quoted that, um, something about, okay, let me think about this, because I'm a little, I'm a little so, like, a little whoopy from, like, the meditation, but, um, okay. You know how they said, like, you're, like, you, you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't, like, like just hide your your like ego or shadow side because if you do you know you you'll like it will it will put emphasis on it and it will make it like if you don't work on your shadow side or like try to heal your like inner child or your shadow side or like your negative more and negative aspects of yourself like i don't know the things that you know you kind of like you're gonna like push away Mm -hmm. and put it put away to the side you know it's not that good because you know it'll make you more destructive and more like upset and more like you know just not in good spirits really mm-hmm. i uh i actually want to put emphasis on that and say that i totally agree with that because like i'm also that kind of person that like if i just hide like everything that i'm like the, all my flaws and all the things that i don't like about myself and, and just put it to the side and never like put emphasis on it or like say that like yeah those things are real and not not, not all of us are perfect you know like it's like it's kind of like that like we won't we won't, it will get worse and worse and worse and worse. And we, and we, if we just put it aside and think like, you know, it doesn't exist. That's not, that's like destructive to ourselves. It's like, you know, hurting ourselves. Cause like we, like, cause we are every bit of ourselves. We aren't like just a perfect human being who, you know, like doesn't have any flaws, doesn't have any things that are like, like we have, we have made mistakes. We have done things that are wrong and making mistakes is okay. Like doing things that are bad are okay. Like it's not, Bad, bad and good doesn't even exist. Like it's all black and white. Like it's not bad and good doesn't even exist. Like I don't think it exists because like everyone can be a good person, everyone can be a bad person. Like bad and good don't exist because like I feel like like yeah you can perceive something as like not that great, but like you know like it's only your opinion. Like literally, it's like bad and good does not exist. I don't know. I just don't think it exists because like everything can be bad and everything can be good. Everyone has this bad side and everyone has this good side. So in a way, it's like kind of like it's kind of like natural you know so i don't know i just want to put emphasis on that anyway yeah (laughs) yeah yeah um he i i think he would say that they both exist but that uh you have to embrace both um yeah you can't push aside or ignore the void which is why he really detested christianity because christianity wouldn't acknowledge that side and it would tell people to stay humble and um you know, worship God. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that, I think that's what he means about the tree, where he says, the higher your branches grow upwards, the deeper your roots go downwards, and it, it coincides, and so you have to use both to go through your own self and come out of the abyss into your ubermensch, your better self. Okay, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I agree. And so let's see what he says here. Um, the sense going on the tree metaphor, the sense of well-being of a tree for its roots, the happiness to know oneself in a manner not entirely arbitrary and accidental, but as someone who has grown out of a past uh, as an air, flower, and fruit. Uh, I think by air, he kind of means the roots. So your past, your present, and your future, um are are all you're all aware of all of it he was very big on being aware of your past and history uh he believed that a big reason we have an existential crisis in modern times right now is because people aren't aware of their history you know that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely what does he say here we um, need to engage in an active exploration of history to attain self-knowledge. Direct self-observation is not enough for us to know ourselves. We need history because the past flows on in us in a hundred different waves, and our psyche is shaped and sculpted by past ages. So, uh, modern people uh, feel abandoned in an absurd world, Uh, according to Nietzsche, because we have uh, a lacking of historical sense and context. And if we don't have a conscious connection to the past, we search endlessly for novelty. And this uh, this is what 
we're doing now. He says that consumerism is this endless cycle where the thing that was new yesterday is old today and we have to have something new today and it's kind of a flat circle where we're not going anywhere we're just um, we're just craving something new all the time and consuming it without any meaning to it and I think that it uh, describes modern capitalism very well I'm I wanted to make a quick point about um, the Ubermunch um, that um, and the last man. So the last man is like humanity uh, as we are um, now with consumer consumerism and um, religion. Uh, and the point I really wanted to make that uh, that he was talking about with this Overman is that it's not like a single person. He's not talking about like a Buddha or a, a, a Jesus. He's talking about like humanity as a whole. And uh, what he's talking about is a sort of evolution or the next evolution of humanity. And that won't be like a physical uh, evolution, but a psychological evolution. So uh, the, the psyche will change so that's what i think he's pointing to when he when he's uh, talking about this uh ubermensch or overman yes exactly this is all about the mind and the psyche and i think that's a big reason why we can relate it to taoism a lot because taoism and meditation is about learning your own mind as well and i think it's so um poignant of him to see that it's not a physical evolution it's not even getting a bigger brain but it's just a psychological step forward into the ubermensch um, he even had people in history who he thought were closest to it uh, Goethe was one Napoleon uh, Caesar was a big one he believed that the ubermensch would be just like Caesar but with the soul of Christ <laughs> um, they had they made their own values. This was huge for Nietzsche, was make your own values. And this was a big reason why God was dead too, was because values from an outside source held no meaning. And you had to go into your own self and create your own values based on who you were and understanding that. And But, <clears throat> but do you guys think, uh, it almost sounds like um, that uh, the, the thought that God is dead, that uh, he saw that as a bad thing because it turned people into these selfish beings that was just uh, going from one thing to the other, consuming constantly. Yeah, and he saw modern society had killed God. He said, you and I did this together because it lost meaning for us. But but in a way, it, it is <clears throat> it is necessary uh, for that to happen uh, bef before you can get to the superhuman. I think mm -hmm. it's kind of like an evolutionary stage from ape to man and then to superman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He he considered himself to be describing the future of humani humanity. Um, into the next two centuries. So he believed that this was what was going to happen psychologically to modern society over the next 200 years, but he said that the last man, which is where we are now, would last a long time uh, because we would be constantly craving and consuming, looking for meaning outside of ourselves and trying to push away the nihilism and the void and the chaos uh, and so the more we pushed that away, the more we would push away the progression of our own selves, the evolution of our own selves. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, that was a School of Life video mostly on the Superman. Um, School of Life is really great too. Uh, School of Life also did the video where they talk about the alcohol part um, and how it numbs you just like Christianity numbed you. He believed that 
religious beliefs are false, but there is a benefit to them, and that the gap in religion should be filled by culture, philosophy, art, literature. Um, literature should replace scripture. He believed that universities were killing the humanities, like all these things, and that these humanities should be our guides to life. Uh, he said the Greeks used to use drama in a cathartic way and to help them understand all of this and it's become just entertainment for us now. He wanted philosophy and art to replace religion and um, that in the 19th century mass democracy and atheism had offered confusion and, and no guidance and no meaning. So he wasn't really big on atheism either. Problem. I agree that the church has just screwed us at this point. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, I could be wrong where about what he's trying to say about um, when he says God is dead. Um, I guess from the very small amount that I've read um, over the last week, it seems to me that he was kind of saying like, we've sort of lost um, what that actually means. Yeah. I think that it was more of like the feeling he was saying, like the true nature of of that, of church and religion just has been completely lost and changed to a point that it just can't be recovered. So you should just abandon it because it's, it's not what it is anymore. Mm-hmm. Actually, I like to say something about that. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Like, okay, thank you. So, um, I actually I went to church for like all my life as like a kid or like a teenager, like until up until like went to high school. I stopped going because it really messed with my mental health and like made me not feel like myself anymore. Like I lost all my identity and just needed to just put all my faith in God and make sure like that. Uh, God is put first before above me, which is not okay because you know we should put ourselves first before anything else. Because you know we're 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 gonna be within our bodies for the rest of our lives, for the rest of this lifetime, and we should just learn to love ourselves and learn to you know make sure that we're putting ourselves first and not not just like someone. I don't want to like I don't want to like you know like push down Christianity because I feel like you know it's like it's not the worst thing ever, but it's not the best thing ever as people perceive it. Now Christians perceive it and like how they, they treat it, you know, how they, t they tell us what it is, but they really don't know themselves, you know? And it's like, literally like the thought of God now is like, I don't know, yeah, I really agree with like the term God is dead. I mean, not really, but I actually kind of do because it's like, no one knows who God truly is at this point. Like the Bible has been rewritten and re-edited so many times that it's like, no one knows what God actually said, like, before everything was like, not, you know, like for these ages, like it's not. Yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense. I hope I'm making sense, but yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. It's it just it's really like, um, it's really like, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's, I'm, I'm gonna say it like triste because that's why I say it in Portuguese. Okay, I'm I'm like I'm Brazilian, but yeah, like triste means like upsetting, like you know, um, and like. I don't know, it's just, it's just really sad, like, how, like, you know, like, thing like, like, people don't, like, the like Christians don't, like, they, they just don't vibe with the thought, like, that's, like, that, like, God is actually a really good person, and, like, you know, and, like, the only thing, like, but he also has bad points, like, you, you know, like, I don't, uh, yeah, I feel like, I feel like I'm just not making sense right now, but I don't know if I'm, I'm <laughs> You're good. Um, yeah. yeah, I think Christianity, uh, I think that's a big reason why a lot of us are here is because Christianity began to feel empty and dead to us, and it wasn't yeah. speaking to something internal inside of us, and that's because it was an external imposition on who we are. And that was a big problem Nietzsche had, was that it came from the outside, and it imposed upon you inside, and real value had to be put together internally. You couldn't just get it from external sources. Um, and when we focus on something just on the outside like God and we reject our inner selves and we reject that inner chaos and void, we are rejecting full reality because it is also reality that's going on inside of us. Um, 
so he said abandon all morality systems altogether and put morality together from structures and values that you create so that you create your own ethical system and that becomes a joyful creative act like an art form so what i had said about it do you do you feel that that's that was sort of what Nietzsche was was meaning? Like I, I would, yeah, I'm asking. I would like your like opinion, sort of what you feel Nietzsche was was saying with the uh, with that statement. Uh, so, what what was it that you had said again? That your your take on it is God is dead. Yeah, basically that it um, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. It sort of had been corrupted to the point that it, it it can't be sort of recovered in it in, in a sense and that you he was telling people you know that god is dead you should just abandon it basically he's speaking about the church and how they operate and ha have sort of lost the true meaning of, of it i didn't know if i was like interpreting what he meant um and i felt like you might have a better uh, understanding of what he was actually meaning about that. Um, so I think that what he meant was that uh, we have all killed God because God doesn't address our full selves and our full reality and therefore it doesn't give us true meaning. It just gets us stuck in this sort of um, cycle of boredom and consumption and um, let's see, he says, uh, in, I think it's a madman in one of his books that says, where is God? I will tell you that we have killed him, you and I, and what we're doing when we un unchained this earth from the sun, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, how do we clean ourselves from having killed God? We must become God. So we have to take the place of the divine principle from which morality stems because the morality coming from the christian church god uh wasn't real it wasn't meaningful it was empty in a way i think i think i understand so it'd be more like um we have been looking um at an at an outside source for to for our morality for our guidance and what he was saying was that you really should be looking uh, inward at yourself because this is going to be more um, useful and um, uh, yeah a better source mm -hmm. than than um, you sort of like giving your power away if you're like looking sort of out outward to um to get help yeah yeah and um and that uh, looking outward towards the christian god didn't acknowledge the passion and will and um the envy the lust the excitement the greed all of the negative stuff inside of us the church was trying to reject it and he felt like we need to embrace that we need to go into it fully uh look upon the void and embrace it and because it exists whether or not we want it to and this is part of reality and so if we reject it it only gets stronger uh, he actually called endless optimism of the church um, focusing only on the good a kind of warped pessimism because it became so much about rejection and about denial Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to derail you. I just thought that, you know, that oh. statement's pretty bold and it could have used just a little bit of flushing out. Um, you were talking about uh, the tree, I think, was the last thing you were talking I mean, it's all related. I think all of these ideas go together because when God is dead and we become God, we become the Ubermensch. And the nature of ourselves is that tree where the roots are our negative void side and the branches are our positive good side. And if you don't embrace them all, you will never understand the full picture. So uh, he uses the term nihilism a lot. Um, he believes that 
uh, we reject nihilism, but what we need to do is embrace it. Um, nihilism comes from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing. So it's kind of a nothingness, it's kind of chaos, it's um, a belief that nothing matters, which is inherently, on the surface, it's contrary to what you would think he's saying, but he believes that we have to embrace nihilism uh, in order to create order. Uh, we have to accept and affirm the tragedy at the heart of existence. Uh, we have to experience loss without consolation. And I think this is a very Zen idea too, because he basically says, accept it for what it is, because it is. Uh, and this goes into the concept of amor fati. Uh, amor fati means to love your fate. Um, and he he didn't believe you had to just accept what happens. He believed you had to love it. You had to fully embrace it. You had to be in love with the suffering as well as the joy. You had to completely love everything that had happened before in history, all of the good and bad, as well as what will happen in the future. And he had a real struggle with this because he had so much that went wrong for him. You know, he, he hated his family, he never got married, he, his books didn't sell, he died really young of a horrible disease. And for, him, for someone like him, whose life was so bad and ended so young, to say, love your fate, it, it becomes even more powerful because it means love all of those negative, chaotic things that you can't control. And this is the void we have to go into, is embracing and loving all of that. Um, let's see. Welcome tragedy. When we welcome tragedy, this is the opening of, the, of history. Um, this is in the bigger hour-long subject, or uh, lecture. So, he said that currently, he wasn't living in a time where we had total economic control of the world, but we do now, and he was kind of predicting that that's where it was going. He believed that modern society would create smaller and smaller specializations for people, and smaller pieces of the wheelwork of machinery that made the whole of the economy move and run, and that it would become a positive feedback loop, canceling out all negativity. Uh, people would just find their little cog place in the world, and aimlessly just turn without any purpose, just kind of, uh, he uses the, the term flat circle a few times. Um, flat circle, when he says it, he kind of means that it's not going anywhere, but he also says in a different place live your life as if you had to live it all exactly the same again, which I think is great. Um, but yeah, so basically our modern society is this flat circle, uh, turning and turning but not going anywhere, maintaining its own power by proclaiming the new and improved, and every day there's something new and there's something improved, but there's no meaning behind it, and it's not actually new, but we're craving novelty all the time, and we're accelerating on that. And the question that we all have is, what is this for? What is the reason? What is the purpose? Um, attempts to give us meaning by canceling out negativity and denying nihilism, de denying our chaotic selves, uh, the internal void, all that negativity will eventually catch up with you um, and we will be reduced as a result of that denial. Who we really are is reduced. Um, so, let's see, he didn't like reactive professions like historians and critics. He thought that there was a deep heaviness and tiredness on the inside. Uh, these people were remaining busy just to be busy so that they wouldn't have to face the horror and the chaos inside of us. Um, this is a really great quote, in everywhere is an obscene haste or no, in everywhere an, an obscene haste 
rules as if one would miss out on something if by the age of 23 a young man is not yet ready or finished, if he does not know yet the answer to today's main question, which career. Higher men, if I may say so, have time. They take their time. They don't even dream of being ready. At the age of 30, one is a beginner, a child of high culture. I thought that was very poignant. I think that goes into um, the concept, which is on my mind a lot lately, of the journey versus the destination where people want to be finished, they want to be done, they want to have an answer, and they want that as quick as possible, and you don't realize that actually you never want to be ready. You you want to have all the time in the world to to stay on the journey, to continue to progress and improve and never actually reach that destination. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, he believed that the modern task of higher education was to turn man into a machine in order to be a cog for this wheel. Um, how does modern education turn people into a machine? It teaches them how to be bored. He, was, he really talked a lot about boredom. Um, how, do, how are we taught to be bored? With duty. With a mindless kind of duty. Uh, our economy of desires is an economy of managed boredom. Distraction becomes the business. Uh, today we are numbing ourselves so that we don't have to face the horror of that emptiness of meaning. It's funny that he lived in the mid-1800s and he can perfectly describe the modern capitalist world that doesn't seem to have meaning and everybody is bored and distract trying to distract themselves with things that don't get them anywhere there's so many good topics <laughs> it's almost like every one of these could be a discussion um it's so it's it's really really good um yeah i mean that just the, that about boredom i mean to take that and to like really contemplate that, you know, um, that's, that's why there are, you know, so many stores with so many things. It's because they are literally selling you boredom. Mm -hmm. And if you can sort of, if you can really see that, it sort of deflates that energy of that in that craving of wanting something new. Not that wanting something new is wrong, but that compulsiveness of uh, of the of wanting that new thing. Um, yeah. You know, whenever whenever you have something that's just as just fine, just fine and, and good, you know, um, kind of like uh, wanting a new gaming computer or even just you know a new game. I mean, the reason you got most likely the reason you got uh, a gaming system and the game anyway was because you were bored and you wanted entertainment, you know, movies. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with any of those, but if you were pretty, if you were content, you would notice that you wouldn't be um, going and getting new things as often. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I've noticed. Like I see I'm, that too. Yeah. I'm perfectly content with the, majority of what I have and if I do get something new it's usually out of necessity I'm not saying always sometimes you know I say oh um, I got a bonus from work and I'll take you know a hundred bucks out of it and just do something um, just because but it's almost I'm doing it consciously and it's sort of the unconscious um, craving of this um, of boredom, of of trying to defeat the boredom that's never ending. That's why I, I like to think of being a minimalist and trying to find a way to not be bored of what I have, even though I am always content with it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do so when seeing all these things, like what Zen said. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that um, we become bored because uh, the new thing that we got today becomes boring tomorrow. And we need another new thing because now we're bored again. And we need to keep distracting ourselves from this. And what Nietzsche wanted us to do was to go into it, uh, to face that horror of emptiness uh, fully, um, to embrace the void. Yep, I agree. Yeah, hey, welcome Drake, by the way. I'm Lauren. <laughs> we're talking about Nietzsche. <laughs> I see. Well, thank you. Yeah. And so... Uh, Amor Fati goes into this as well because basically he said you want to not just accept that you're bored or accept that you have a dark side or envy or uh, greed or anything else, but you want to love it. You want to absolutely lo fall in love with your fate and affirm it. And, um, and only when you can embrace it can you begin to use it. Um, and he describes it as the will to power. Uh, basically, you have this energy and this will, and this will wants to do things, like it wants to buy the next iPhone. And if you can embrace it and face it, you can direct that energy uh, in a different direction. And you can suddenly use all of those instincts and that, and that chaos and this is what he means by imposing order and ethics and value on chaos, is when you can embrace it, then you can use it. Mm. That does make sense, if I think about it. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of uh, something somebody said once where, like, they would, like, breath meditate their way to experiencing pure intention. Like, their will and their desire and their intention in a pure, like, level. Hmm. Yeah, this part, this is where he does stray from more Buddhist ideas, because in Buddhism, you would assume that you would want peace within uh, and harmony. And Nietzsche said, absolutely not. He did not believe in peace within. He thought that was just you rejecting your inner chaos. And, that, and that's where he says, you must have chaos in you to give birth to a dancing star. And I'm not sure if we can reconcile them or not, because as soon as you embrace and accept your chaos, is it still chaotic? Or does it become a kind of order and peace when you accept it and love it? that's yeah that's uh that's how i was taking it um another thing about the uh embracing chaos uh to give birth to a dancing star um was sort of uh embracing this um sort of idea of like how others should be so like you can see others acting in in ways that you don't disagree that you disagree with um, ways that you that they may act towards you and this can could be seen as sort of a chaotic and sort of embracing that is embracing like their um sort of freedom to to be um that way in that in that way of chaos is like not fit doesn't fit with how you would want things, how you would order things if you could. So that's that was the other part of it. So it was like an inner, embracing this sort of inner chaos, but the, the outer chaos of like sort of unpredictability and just embracing that and being completely okay mm -hmm. with that. Exactly. Mm. This is a different form the way I'm seeing it. It's like, uh, how can I put it? Having peace from again from within a Buddha but it seems like he's like half reversed embracing the chaos and actually accepting who you are inside and out to be able to find a different form of inner peace the way I'm hearing it just acceptance not just acceptance but love and he does stress love, this yes. difference because if you just accept it you're not really quite embracing it and that's why it's amor fati you have to love what is necessary to love what has happened before and not just accept it and not wish to change it um I see. yeah 
does he give a description of how to love? Does he ever say that? Yeah, how, how to love the chaos. How to love the chaos. Um, I believe he says you have to go into it. Um, you have to go deep into your own void. Um, let me see if I can find a quote here. Mine's pretty dark. <laughs> yeah. <And laughs> he says it can be scary. Um, oh, mine is. Let's see. He wanted to... He considered his philosophy as a type of hammer. Um, he wanted... Let's see. I'm trying to just scan through my notes and see if he does specifically say how to love it. Amor Fati. So, okay. uh, the love of one's fate. Enthusiastic happiness for one's life. Accept what has occurred, both good and bad, and with strength and an all-embracing gratitude of enthusiastic affection. Um, he, a quote from him is, I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things. Uh, no war against what is ugly. Don't accuse even those who are accusing. Um, it is, Amor Fati becomes a formula for greatness where you want nothing to be different. Um, it is an attitude of vitality and conquest of obstacles. But in order to live a good life, we have to keep in mind opposing ideas. Uh, and this is the difference, I suppose, between peace and chaos. This is both the eagle and the snake. Uh, you have to have kind of contrasting ideas in your mind uh, and believe both of them and live both of them. Uh, he said, we don't need to be consistent. We don't need to be consistently happy or consistently chaotic uh, because we have both in us and we can use both like tools depending on where we are and what we need so that that energy in the chaos becomes used into where you want it to be. So like emotional sculpting. Yes, actually he even uses the uh, concept of a sculptor Towards the end of the Academy of Ideas, How to Become Who You Are, he says, um, It is a myth to believe that we will find our authentic self after we have left behind or forgotten one thing or another. Uh, to make ourselves, to shape a form from various elements, that is the task. The task of a sculptor, of a productive human being. I think this kind of connects to what Lauren uh, talks about a lot is this sort of duality and so like the, that's sort of like embracing or loving both sides because you're you're seeing that both sides require you know the thing that you may be looking at that you like you know if you like peace well you must have chaos mm -hmm. so you have to you have to love both if you're if you're looking at it correctly and you know you you have to embrace that in yourself too because you you're a human being and you live you you have to live life and not every situation that you're going to find yourself in is going to um, require the same approach so just as an example, you know, if there was a somebody trying to rob you, you might need to embrace a little chaos, you know, I'm not saying like go and murder them, but <laughs> you might have to get a little angry, you know, and so like, you can't just be all peace blissed out, um, you know, uh, all is good, because, you know, that's, so, it's, it's this sort of flow. Um, I, that's the best I, I could think of right now. Take action within the chaos that makes sense to help yourself. And then I can't remember the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so he believed that this was like having a mental toolkit. Um, and why limit yourself with what you can use? Uh, use the peace and serenity and happiness when you can. Use the chaos when you can. He believed having both a vigorous willing and a kind of fatalism and acceptance were, were necessary because there are things 
that you do have to accept and so you should love and embrace that and there are things you can change through your will and love and embrace that as well and if you love both you won't struggle when you can't do one or the other because you have both Accepting yeah you, you always have a uh, a tool that can you can use for the job and i love that that tool analogy i i kind of use that a lot with uh, like these different ideas and concepts and um yeah it, it's a lot like that it's a lot like having these different tools that are you know some are have are multi-purpose mm -hmm. some are um purposed for one thing so you're, you're just sort of learning what the tools can do and what they can't and then you're also having to learn how how to use them and in, in, in what situations to use them. But sometimes the tools can hurt oneself. Self-destruction. Yeah, he does warn about um, a lot of dangers going into the void because it can be dark. And he even says on rare occasions you can go into madness, but um, you can only be aware of what dangers there are if you go into it. And that's mm -hmm. when you can be aware of what might happen and what might come at you. And if you're not aware of that, uh, you could go your whole life shunning it and avoiding it and trying to push away all the negativity until it becomes overwhelming and you're not aware of what's about to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he also mentions that that might not be for everyone to go into the world. Mm -hmm. That some, uh, for some it would be a mistake even. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so the end bit of Amor Fati that I wrote down, I really love because uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti says this a lot. He even says this phrase, to say yes to the whole of life. And he, he repeats that a lot, and I thought it was really nice that Nietzsche goes into this as well, and he says that everything is abound in a web closely together, and that what went right and what went wrong are as one. And we must accept both instead of wishing that things had been otherwise. And that's what it means to say an abundant and vital and willful yes to the whole of life. This, this makes me think, like, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I had thoughts about it when I was going through Buddha and through it, reading his text and all that stuff. But I do see the other side as well. And he's the one who's actually talking about it. I got to look into it. Mm-hmm. I'm interested. I mean, I think that uh, dualism talks about this too. I mean, it's represented in the symbol of the yin yang, the dark and the light, and they require each other. Um, I do think that in Buddhism, we can get hung up on uh, seeking peace too much and rejecting the chaos. I thought it was interesting that he says direct self observation is not enough for us to know ourselves. We also need history because. Um, you know, I, I personally tend to think that meditation is all that's required to know ourselves. And he, he rejects that. And he says, we cannot separate ourselves from what has come before us, our history, our culture, our own personal history, as well as where we live and what has happened before has all culminated in our psyche to make us who we are now. And I think that this is where Carl Jung got the concept of archetypes, historical archetypes that have a deep ancient id center in our minds, all the way back to before we were even mammals, like deep-seated archetypes. And, and that's what Nietzsche is kind of talking about. Yeah, so um, I thought that was interesting because, you know, we kind of started our first talk on Carl Jung and um, man's, what was it, uh, symbols, I think it was something about symbols, and so we were talking a lot about archetypes, and I didn't realize that Nietzsche had influenced Freud and Jung so much, and seeing him talk about these prehistorical ancient drives and impulses that stretch all the way back to um, our animal self, which is still in us, deep in our being. Um, uh, these potentially destructive inclinations that come from this animal self, like our aggression or our lust. Um, and, and Carl Jung took that and built upon it and 
basically created his whole concept of archetypes. Yeah, I didn't get that far into uh, Nietzsche, so I don't uh, really have anything um, about that. It's but it is interesting. It's basically the same as the chaos and the void. It's um, it's him saying, don't repress that animal nature within. Explore it, become familiar with it, and you can channel it and handle it properly. Um, he refers to it as a divine animal. Um, and that these ancient instincts are what allow us to thrive. This is where a lot of our passion and our drive to live comes from. Well, scientifically, that makes sense because um, I don't know the names, scientific names for them, but uh, your your brain actually is like uh, sort of three brains. Um, it was like a smaller one, and then there's another like type of brain or lobe that's wrapped around that one and then I think the frontal cortex were added on last that kind of makes sense um, I mean and also you can't really forget like I try to remind myself all the time you know like we're we're animals you know we call ourselves humans but you're an animal you're you're a monkey basically mm -hmm. you're just evolved and so like keeping that in your mind like I'm an animal just like all the other animals out in the forest, um, I just am able to speak and communicate differently. Yeah, and I think this is a, a big fundamental place where the id, ego, superego concept comes from, which Nietzsche was referring to as the ape self, the last man, and the superman. And it's this idea that I'm a step above that primitive animal self, you know, I'm not 100% driven by those instincts anymore. I have a self-awareness now and I can also see the horizon. I can see the future. I can see when I have transcended who I am now and become either more understanding or uh, transcended in some way. That Superman and this this is what so many of us feel inside of us that we can reach uh, and that's what we seek. I think that's why we come here. That's why we practice meditation. We're seeking that Superman side of us. Yeah, I um, completely agree. It's just a bit dangerous, <laughs> uh, I guess. <laughs> to go um, into... I... What is? Oh, uh, To go into the more animal aspects of what I am, um, it's quite dangerous. Uh -huh. I... I mean, you do need to, in life, I, I suppose, one must leverage their aggression appropriate to get to where they want to go. Um, so, yeah, um, it's just dangerous. Yeah, yeah I agree. it's I, dangerous. I think, um, you know, we have a lot of base instincts and emotions, like an example in one of these videos was envy and yeah. that the church tries to reject envy and ignore it and he says instead don't be ashamed of it just use it as a guide to understand yourself and what it is that you really want so if you embrace your envy and look on it completely you begin to understand where that feeling comes from and what it is that you really want deeper down that created that feeling in the first place and then you can use that desire that uh, craving that envy to channel it in a in a more productive way than just simply feeling envious mm. yep <laughs> and yeah, yeah this is the I... dark side of our nature and it can probably get dark with a lot of people and as Alex said maybe not everybody should do it I don't know how you would determine whether or not you should but um I would say that embracing that darkness doesn't mean becoming it. It just means looking at it. Uh, because if we yeah, were to take... Acting. Huh? I'm sorry, I said or acting on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because if we were to take a, uh, a more zen approach to this, we would say that you are neither your chaos or your optimism. Or, you know, you are a balance of both the order and the chaos, but also neither. Which is why you can use both. Yeah, I think it's difficult to harbor a lot of envy 
without acting on it, especially if it makes you angry. Uh, I th I think it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. I think well, from, you know, Buddhist perspective, like traditionally, you know, people doing this type of work are going to traditionally be in a, in a monastery with like a teacher. And so there's going to be people around them that care about them and are looking after them and can kind of help them through these more difficult things. So that's the uh, benefits of that, doing it on your own. Um, you know, you're correct. It can be a, li a little dangerous or confusing. You may end up doing something that you didn't really mean to do. Um, if, if it can, if it gets overwhelming for you. Um, but this work, you know, can be done. It's just, uh, having some work, maybe the right environment, a friend or family or something that can kind of help you that kind of understands what, what you're going for. Right. Um, well, I'm familiar with this thing called shadow work. I've heard of this term shadow work. Um, I don't know what you've heard of it or if you've done any shadow work. Sounds like um, Canon. Yeah, I believe it might be. Uh, so yeah, um, and of course, I mean, I've read some. I've read some Jung, and I found his work very difficult to understand. For one, but what I did get from it, I found helpful. So, yeah. Mm. The question really is, like, what is the shadow? And what also, is the shadow? Yeah, um, different definitions of it, I guess, out there. Um, it's like Carl Jung's concept of the shadow was basically something we also had to overcome. It's pretty much like through like active investigation of one's own consciousness, we can go past this blockade known as the shadow and what is perceived as as the shadow, and then we can achieve this open whatever state of mind do you have some kind of definition of what the shadow is for you i would say that um i would label it as a, a fear fear is is going to be the shadow um and then all these negative labels that we put you know envy jealousy um all of those are just just different flavors of fear so if you look at jealousy you can see that actually it's just fear there. I, I don't know if it's like fear exactly. And so the shadow from level. what I understand is your repressed self. If you are young and in your households say that expressing your emotions every time you start to cry about something as, as a boy specifically, especially your dad tells you you're a man, you know, you're not allowed to cry. Only little girls cry. And then you repress that part of yourself. You're like, I'm not allowed to show my emotions. I'm not allowed to cry. And then say that, you, you know, later you're an adult in high school or something. And, and you see another boy crying, you know, you get all pissed off and you're like, you shouldn't be crying. You're a man, blah, blah, blah. Well, you've repressed that part of yourself and that part of yourself is now your shadow. And you have these beliefs and opinions wrapped around it saying that despite the fact that if that is you, you have emotions, you, you push it down and say, no, I shouldn't have emotions, I shouldn't be feeling, not allowed to, I have to keep myself in check. Hmm. Hmm. It's like, yeah, I, I've, I've heard it described as the disowned or the repressed self. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. But also the shadow will very strong opinions that really like, like like say that I'm at a party and normally I'm this very clean cut chick and I'm, you know, and I go to this, this company party and there's this chick that's, you know, you know, high skirt or something and flirting with all the guys. And all of a sudden I'll be like, I hate her. I don't even know who she is. I have no basis, you know, to hate her, but I freaking hate her because she is, I don't see doing all of the things that I would like to do. Do you see what I'm saying? So in a way it almost creeps into your, you like, like instincts that's why some people say don't follow your gut all the time because sometimes you could look at somebody and have this immediate reaction and it's actually your shadow especially when it comes to things like barring freaking perspectives 
That's a really good point about not following your uh, instincts all the time. Uh, depends, I guess. Like, I think our instincts are important. But, yeah, they are. But maybe it's not important necessarily to follow them always, but there always might be something important, like, in them. Like, it's definitely not important to ignore and repress things like that, mm. you know what I mean? Like, if they come up. Yeah, I, I, I think you should try and understand where they come from. And and so to learn from from that, may, maybe it's pointing to some kind of attachment, and that's important to understand. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Something like that. Yeah, because in my experience, like following a certain yeah, we call it instinct, um, might not always be pleasant, but in my experience, it always led me to something I need to look at just like echo just said i i realized the exact same thing that most of the time if not all of the time you're basically you know pissed about your shadow and something you're um something within you that you see in another person and i think you can basically do this with every thought and everything and every feeling you have about a situation or a person or something and you can always trace it back to how you relate so if you always ask the question like what does that mean to me and how do I relate to that you always get some kind of answer because we we have to kind of um take position in a sense like in the world we we we're trying to like get into a certain position or place or something you know we could call it a morale or morality um maybe even taste or something like that but we usually position ourselves in some kind of way we like this we don't like this blah 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 and so um to me it seemed that the experiences um in the outside quote unquote are always related to the inside um, because you know if things wouldn't matter to us we wouldn't react to them like if you wouldn't be like if you wouldn't have a problem with the girl at the party if you if you would have done the work so to say the shadow work and work through all that stuff it wouldn't trigger you and you wouldn't have a problem with your intuition in that moment um, because you might be paying attention to some other things. So uh, um, I would say that, like, I, I, I go a lot of based on that idea. And I, I think, personally, I think that everything around me is basically like a reflection of myself. Because, again, I can always ask the question, what does it mean to me? Like, why do I feel this way? How do I relate to that situation or that person or so? And so um, I'm always kind of challenged to, you know, face the shadow in a sense. And usually the indicator is some kind of feeling. Sometimes it's like, uh, we're talking about bad feelings mostly, like when, when it's unpleasant. Um, but of course, there are positive aspects as well. Um, and that kind of leads back to a question that I had, had earlier, um, really is the question like, what what do you want? Because when we're talking about like shadow work and stuff like that, or aspects, um, maybe there are different words. I mean, like I'm, I was asking for a reason what shadow work is, because there are even darker aspects, you know, I suppose, you know, all people in the room have some kind of positivity in them and they strive to be good, quote unquote. But we all know that there are people on this planet who have a different uh, mode of operation and mm -hmm. they have learned a different lifestyle, so to say, and they might be able to do to like go into even darker places than we are actually be able to. Um, I mean, like childhood wounds and stuff is one thing, but like, I don't know. Just use your imagination what, like, the shadow actually could be. So the question really is, because Lauren mentioned that we 
basically would like deal with both aspects like light and the shadow but then the question is what what is it that i want like if i'm if i'm getting triggered by something and i'm getting angry the the simple answer would be okay of course i wouldn't want to be angry maybe but maybe to another person that's kind of okay because you know they have the reasons to do that i don't know like I think it's a question of morality that I'm asking here and what you're striving for, you know, if you're dealing with the shadow, is your is your ultimate goal as a person to strive for something good? Or are you actually able to, you know, embrace a more darker side and to, um, I don't know, like maybe justify or like use it for your life? So you could, I think, use the negative side, the shadow, maybe, um, in a, in a different way. So I'm asking, are we fundamentally positive, good beings? Um, I think shadow work for me has been immensely helpful um, in getting me to adjust and adapt to the demands of the real world, and knowing that things aren't simple sometimes, right? And you mentioned a couple of things that I thought was very interesting. One, you mentioned that we are trying to fight for, we fight, I use the word fight, but we try to maybe negotiate a position in the social world. Uh, and I imagine all of us do that to some extent. Um, and I think the purpose of shadow work is to be better adjusted and, and you're wiser and you're, you recognize some shortcomings of reality. And especially to the, in, you know, today, with the way things are, now is the time for shadow work, I think. So I don't think that shadow work necessarily means that you're going to be going into this and start expressing darker sides more. Shadow work is more for looking at yourself and the world around you and being able to recognize the darkness and not get triggered by it. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. I, I agree. Um, like Lauren was just talking about Amor Sati, it's it's being able to recognize the darkness, love and respect why it's there. Mm -hmm. Um, but like uh, going back to Nietzsche, wouldn't it be in some form like necessary or beneficial to do that in a way? Like you could you could take it, like if if we think we're gonna explore this thing, you know, if I'm saying like okay. To fully understand what that darkness is, and I'm talking about more than shadow work here, um, would I need to go very deep into it, live it in a sense? Because most of the time we, you know, we we live in the light, so to say. We we strive for something good um, that personally makes us feel good. And I guess these are morals, but of course also our feelings and how we relate to the world. But if we change that, you know, if if I if I was being like totally egotistic and it kind of works for me, um, I could go down that road and explore some really dark aspects. And of course, I guess my my psyche would like <laughs> um, get a, get a small crack or something. You know, that's that's my assumption. But I'm saying like. Um, with everything in the world, you would, you know, you can explore it very deep. So, how I, I think everything has to be on the table. Everything I think with shadow work, you need to be able to look at all the dark aspects of life and see the hideousness of what it is, and and it be on the table to you. Now, I wouldn't recommend that you go ahead and become an idiot or do something terrible, right? But it, I think if you if you are an integrated person. And you've integrated your shadow you've also again like looked at the repressed desires that you might have had in your life uh and i think yeah you know i think you're right i mean like some some level of experience of actual world experience is i think um the only way to prove to yourself that you have integrated your shadow um uh, maybe it relates to the idea of loving it in a sense well i don't know so uh, uh, to me i not a romantic love, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I think that um, 
it's not about when you want to go into the shadow side uh, I think it just relates to understanding it because it's there and if you try to ignore it it will become more unconscious and wild and you won't really be in control of what's going on there but if you do go into it fully and embrace it and love it and understand what's going on you can harness that energy that will that desire that wants to be envious and use it to uh, direct that understand energy the way that you want to yeah, yeah and when she says embrace it and love it she doesn't necessarily mean say mean act on it you see what I'm saying you tiger have the possibility right now of becoming the next Hitler if you wanted to mm -hmm. and and to be able to look <laughs> at yourself nice. and go whoa i can do that i have that possibility holy crap or and and when you don't and not like throw the hitler thing aside say say, say that you have the recognize it in yourself as say you're in a par partner relationship i have the possibility of becoming somebody who could be so mad that they beat their partner and they commit you know mental atrocities and, and domestic violence all the time i have that capability within me and you accept that and you embrace that yourself that you you have that potential then you become more aware when it might be cropping up because what lauren's saying if you say no i that, that's not me i could never do anything like that then it will present itself in other aspects in your life without your consent yeah exactly very well said yeah i was just gonna say and it's kind of might be a mute point at this uh, junction um, that maybe taking like a single thing um, like anger and sort of like using that as an, like an object to, to, to talk about this um, sort of thing might be a little more helpful instead of just saying shadow sides. But uh, yeah, just like Lauren said and, um, and to echo, yeah, it's basically being aware you start to recognize patterns. Oh, I'm in this situation and I, seems like every time I in this situation I get really angry so there's the awareness recognizing it and then you sort of explore and sort of dissect this it's like why is this happening you know and and sort of like looking in and trying to pick it apart and figure it out why this seems to just keep happening if that's what you want um uh I remember a talk with, uh, I haven't seen him in a while, uh, Bales, and Lauren was present too uh, when he talk, uh, spoke about um, anger. I think the idea was like anger in the workplace or something. Mm -hmm. And for him, the I don't know who of the two said it, but like the idea would be, you know, to either look at it or live it in a sense. I know we're talking about shadow work and I understand these aspects, but I just want to take a little bit further and say uh, um, maybe sometimes it's just, you know, needed to be that anger, that envious side, whatever. Um, not that I personally want that in a sense. You know, I prefer like a balanced state too. And th thus I understand what you're talking about. What about I'm just like exploring the concept in general and saying like, you know, maybe you have to sometimes forget about all these things because we are like, we are aware of this and we're looking at anger, but like Bales was suggesting, you know, I forgot his words. I think it was something like, you know, um, you're yeah, the remember. anger. He was talking about yeah. being at work and being angry. Um, uh, you know, I think that there's a difference between being angry and acting on that anger. You can feel angry and just sit in that feeling and without, uh, without trying to be less angry or reject it or without acting on it either. Yeah, but I think the point is um, that a part of us wants to be angry in that situation. Oh, yeah. um, because we're talking about suppression then. Um, I'm not saying you should act on it, but I know the feeling very, very well. You know, you could look at uh, all different kinds of emotions and just sit there and watch it and not act upon it. But there's still a part uh, that kind of wants to get it out. And I think it's healthy in a way. I'm not suggesting you should do it, 
um but i think there's something to it you know um giving it some space so to say i think that was what was uh bay was um suggesting there um yeah. like I... kind of like like kind of honoring the anger in that sense embodying it you see mm -hmm. and i think that nietzsche would agree and he would probably say um you don't want to just acknowledge it part of the embracing and the loving it is seeing uh Right. That it's good to have that kind of vitality and energy. And what you really want to do is to harness it. Uh, not just watch it, but to take that energy and put it into something else. So that you're not just reacting out of anger, but you're using the energy created by the anger to do something. And it really requires understanding this dark side and where this anger comes from and uh, the deeper causes of it so that you can redirect it into how you'd like it to be. Um, yeah, it's not about suppressing, like, say, save it. I mean, anger is a righteous energy. And you're going through work and you're getting pissed about things. You're accepting that you're pissed, but then you hold that until you go to fight club later after work. You know what uh -huh. I mean? And, and there's something beautiful and like exhilarating about just letting it all out and pummeling somebody's face in after work and everybody's <laughs> cool with it everybody accepts it and and then that way it's not something that is now out of your control yeah oh um would you would you say that is the case because i could argue that you know anger is taking you over well, well, yeah, but that... you've, you've given space now to create this fight club after work where other people want to to give space for it and to let it out and to enjoy the anger and to enjoy the pain and to enjoy that sort of thing, rather than it becoming something that spills out into your life and is something that, you know, you're losing, you're losing control over your, your directed life over. I think it's... this is the bare minimum for the shadow work. This is the bare minimum in my point of view. Um, but I say go for it, you know. Uh, I know that when I've been through tough times, that was that was how I handled things. And it worked. <laughs> I don't know. Because there is something divine and righteous about these quote-unquote darker aspects. And just because that you, you were giving space to allow them to express themselves in your life doesn't mean you are becoming that. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh... Yeah. And just <clears throat> like Lauren was saying, the clearer that you become to knowing where where this is originating, that's going to give you, directly give you more control so that there aren't, you, you don't shift into this like uncontrolled um, area uh, of it. Huh? Yeah, I think you're, you're going to look for, you're looking for an example, are you? We're using anger as an example. Okay, but like by an uncontrolled anger, what would that be specifically? Um, lashing out at people. Okay. Using your anger to further your goals. Doing things that afterwards you wish you hadn't done. Unintentionally yelling or um, at somebody or, yeah, uh, yeah, really getting angry at them without sort of want. But anger itself uh, means that you're not controlling yourself because who wants to be angry? That's right? the question. I guess so. Look, I, I, would, I would never put them off the table, right? And that, I think actually saying... Saying something like, I never get angry. I'm never going to let my anger get out of control. I, I, I mean, I think I, I understand the point exactly, but I'm just trying to be aware that saying that you never get angry and repressing anger can actually be one of the worst ways to uh, to to be controlled by it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, uh, and I think using your anger to get ahead that's got to be on the table i mean like you've got i think integrating envy in my opinion i don't know but you know properly means that you know and if you integrate your shadow properly it means that you do have the power to do others harm and in fact you certainly could and in fact it shouldn't it shouldn't bother you that much 
you know, really. And I, that's my opinion. I mean, it's just what I'm saying. It it, it doesn't mean anything, really. Um, at least it shouldn't mean that much. But I just think you should be able to do harm to other people, right? Uh, and... Oh, uh, well, well, well. I, I, we have that on record. That. <laughs> no, I, I have it on record. And but you are able to harm other people. Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should be able to. I think that's fine. That's yeah, part of the you. rules of the game, and um, I'm all for it. You know, I, I, I mean, in a sense, not, not in an, in an ex extremely horrible sense, but um, I all think the world's a stage kind of situation. Kind of, but it's it's also I see it almost like how can I put it this way? People don't recognize that you're really, you know, they don't see you as a threat or dangerous. Uh, you, you might get you, you might get walked all over if you don't have the ability to cause other people harm. It doesn't mean that you have to insist that you're able to do so, but I'm saying that you need to understand the psychopath's perspective, right? You do, um, on some level. I I really really recommend that because I don't want anyone because as a matter of self defense and it's because I don't want people getting hurt, right? That's that's the reason I don't want people to get hurt. And I don't want to be hurt, ultimately. I, I think what we're talking about, though, is sort of like self-work, self-work, and, and the difference between controlled anger and non-controlled anger. So it's be like, sure. like if you had a bow and arrow and you have a blindfold on and you just start shooting arrows randomly, that's, that's mm -hmm. uncontrolled. But you can still wield that bow and arrow without the blindfold and we're not saying you can't shoot arrows we're just saying be a little more controlled with it it's a good metaphor i suppose so um i don't know <laughs> uh i think you i think anger has different utilities and different usages I think that's also a big question. I think the problem of the shadow work is not just with self, but it's also understanding the shadows of others people. Because we have this notion of shadow projection, for example, where we insufficiently understand the intentions of others. A branch between like anger and violence. And, you know, we live in a violent world um, as far as that's concerned. But what is anger at its base? I mean, to me, anger at its base is a strong dislike for whatever your present reality is or like a strong preference being not fulfilled by existence at the moment and that's where anger comes from sure yeah i see that anger really is uh is a kind of fear uh that you're responding to in in a violent way often yeah there's anger yeah. and there's a yeah, there's maybe there's a wider use of the term, if we want to be very precise, but there's also aggression, right? And I think aggression needs to be on the table, you know, um, for for a fully integrated person, for for someone that's really know, knows what they are. Like, I think Watts talked about this, like, um, about, he mentioned Jung, and he said that Jung had this, this look in his eye that, uh, that had this kind of look in his eye that, kind of showed that, you know, he, he, he knew, he gave the devil his due, right? <laughs> Carl Jung? Yeah. He's, well, he's Carl, of young. Carl Jung will say the devil is you, right? He'll say... <laughs> the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and apparently yeah. he got a lot of this from Nietzsche and the void and nihilism. Right. Yeah, yeah, you have to explore that. Like, you just have to. You have to be content and comfortable with discomfort, and you need to be able to cause harm to other people. Otherwise, I don't believe, I, I, to be fully integrated, right? You need to experiment with that at least a couple of times. You have to try being cruel to a friend that calls you up, um, but maybe you didn't really like that much anyway, and reject going out with him and go out with somebody else for some, for some reason. I don't know. Like, I think that has to be on the table somehow. And it's not just and it's not just because you want to be an asshole twenty four seven. It's because you can be an asshole and it's open to you and hey, you know, that's part of life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to put it like in a more simple way. But I uh, think I think that's 
Nietzsche would say that you cannot impose values on someone else. So all of your values have to come internally. If you build your own ethical system that doesn't want to hurt others, it's still okay to feel anger and it's okay to use that anger and that energy in some way. But if it goes against your internal principles to hurt someone else, you wouldn't want to use it to hurt someone. But what if it doesn't? Well, that's your own personal core values, and um, Nietzsche would say, don't listen to other people, only listen to yourself. Yeah, you you get to choose. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't think anybody's right. I don't know, and nobody's, like, in a way, there's, there is some, there is some flexibility or moral relativism. I do give it, I do give it some space, and, and I don't know, like... I feel like I, I want to say something, but I don't have the words for it. it still I see isn't... what you're saying, and it's hard to find the words, yeah. It still isn't yeah. just one or the other, though, because if you embrace the dark side, it doesn't mean only embrace the dark side. Uh, the eagle and the snake have to fly together. So if you build an ethical system that is only based on your chaos and dark side, you're still missing half the picture. You're just missing the other half that most religions are focused on. Sure, well, and agree. then and then you know natural consequences you know things will happen you know if you just you know randomly yell at your friends well they'll probably kind of you know uh stop talking to you you know just natural consequences so you kind of have to pick and yeah. choose yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well that that sort of aggression is that sort of anger is i don't think ever useful or welcome probably no i don't think so either um so yeah there you go um well, there you go. I, I, maybe it could be useful in some rare circumstances, but largely no. I have a personal example as to when I accepted anger within myself and I used it to my benefit, and I was intentionally using it to my benefit to destroy a situation in my life. I just six months ago got out of a 20 year abusive relationship where I was being pimped out and i was being horribly mentally abused and for a very long time i thought this is what i've accepted this is you know i just need to live with it and i just need to be as i am and try and make the best out of it and at a certain point i i decided no more and i started using that anger I, instead of just bearing it all the time saying i i chose this life i just have to keep giving love because one day eventually I'll get it back which never happened um, I started using that hate and that rage and that anger to start destroying the tethers that I had to this person and started to turn around almost like a animal like a, I felt like a caged dog that had been beaten for so long turning on their owner and yeah sometimes it was a little out of my control like I would say things they were completely nasty and be like, whoa, where'd that come from? And be surprised at myself. But at the same time, it was doing what needed to be done because I finally got free. There you go. So maybe there are circumstances where it's helpful. And did you feel like this catharsis, if I call it a catharsis, wasn't just helpful for the person, but also it helped you adjust in some way? Oh, it was 100% for me to, to extract myself from the situation. Like he... He wants to be with me still. He wishes that frickin' it hadn't happened that way and all this other jazz so that he, I could still be his moneymaker and he can still go out and date other people and come back with wow. diseases and stuff, which he was doing. Oh um, my God. Yeah, it was really bad, dude. Like my, my cognitive dissonance was so super bad. And so I used that hate and rage and anger and I put it into even the, the, the um, not so toxic versions of, of parts that, that were existing between us so that I could sever those ties for myself and free myself. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm still recoiling yeah. for, for channeling that, that aspect of myself, but I have accepted that I have that aspect and now I have to watch it because like I'm, I've, I've worked, I've, I've acted in this aspect in this anger aspect for so long and basically becoming a monster that I'm like, okay, I'm around my family now and they didn't have anything to do with this. Where in my life now am I acting on these instincts even though it is not warranted and not needed? 
So like I'm I'm still it, I'm still recoiling from 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 doing that. I'm still in the sense you could say damaged from it, but I it's it's not hidden from me anymore. That's really important, I think. And I think it things like that can happen if you are in cognitive dissonance, all right? When you are being sort of gaslit in the situation and uh you have internalized a whole bunch of different anger and you know everybody lives with some degree of internalized anger repressed anger but you need to externalize it in some form otherwise i think nearly anyone will go mad and yeah. I, I, my question to you is um if you didn't explode in the way that you did do you really think it would have had the same effect do you really think that you would have I, I, I don't, I, I think that it was actually required in a lot of cases because yep. if I would talk to him one on one and be like, hey, this is how I feel. I really want to be respected, which I did a lot, by the way. He'd go, oh, that's totally cool. That's totally cool, babe. And then, you know, it would be okay for a month, but then it wouldn't anymore. Like, right. like I had such cognitive dissonance and such a predisposition to love this person that I even gave up a child for adoption to continue the cognitive dissonance that one day I'm going to be respected and one day things are going to be healthy enough to have a baby with. And even in the case where he was talking about when I was pregnant, right? And he's like, he wanted to, okay, like, I'm sorry if I trigger anybody. He wanted to have sex with our child. Oh and I didn't even allow myself to get angry. Then I just worked like the beating dog to find a way to extricate the child from the situation to save the baby. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a, this is a clear example. I think um, if there ever was one, I don't think a human being should be expected to maintain a sense of, well, very rarely, unless you're, you're the Buddha. Okay. But um, you know, uh, sometimes our impulsive emotions have to be on the table. Because there are circumstances where I don't know, like if if I was in anything relatively like this, I think I would explode in anger a couple of times. I can't be expected to be a sage and run around like I'm like the next Buddha or something, uh, like reincarnation of the Buddha. Yes, yeah, I'm a human being. I think that's what we're saying here is that yeah, we've you been have saying to that. have all yeah. these things on the table. Yeah, that's that. Nobody's arguing against that. What we're wondering about is controlled versus uncontrolled anger because anger comes with a will to do something Nietzsche called it the will to power and you cannot ignore that will uh, you have to use it and channel it into the way that you want it to or else it just becomes too chaotic and then you lose control over the situation so reacting right. out of anger without control can result in things that you don't want and if you can use that energy with control, you can, anger suddenly does become embraced. Very well. But yeah, I'd say all of these things have to be on the table. That's what Nietzsche means by embracing the void. I suppose. I don't know. I think, I do, I, I think that there are limits on a human being and I, I love humanity. There's an intellectual sort of love that comes for loving humanity. And I think that is to love all the things that human do. And I mean this in a very abstract way. Like even, and I don't mean this in an emotional way, by the way. I mean this in an intellectual way. I think you need to love humanity for all the evil that there isn't within it, but in it with an intellectual distance. It was, it was Eckhart Tolle who said, um, like, when asked about is suffering necessary, his answer was, no, suffering isn't necessary, but once you become aware enough, you see why it's there. I think, is it necessary to what would be the question? Because if the answer is, is it necessary to feel joy? I would say yes. Okay. Um... <clears throat> so is it necessary for what? That's what they say in the Kabbalah. Well, I think suffering is necessary in the aspect of it gets you to reflect on, on what's going on around you. And there's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain is something that exists in your body for a little bit or whatever, and then it's gone. But suffering is something that you choose to keep coming back to. And, and when you're suffering, you are, you are, you, your subconscious is trying to tell you something. It's saying there's something here that, that needs to be worked out, something you're not aware of. 
And once you become aware of it, you're no longer suffering anymore. Like I have an example of, I mean, I'll say that you're walking around and you're pissed all the time because you smell like crap and you, 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 you yeah, all your friends don't want to hang out with you because you smell like crap and you know, freaking you can't get a job because you smell like crap. But what if you had the awareness to realize it's because you don't wipe your ass <laughs> then then you wouldn't be mad anymore you wouldn't be you would be embarrassed you know you would take care of it and then you wouldn't smell like crap anymore you would no longer be suffering because you don't smell like crap yeah it's um necessary it uh can be a really great motivator i mean i don't uh i don't see it as um a bad thing um i think that if you feel joy when you're around someone and then they die and you suffer because they're not there that's okay because that suffering is there only because they mm -hmm. brought you joy and if you didn't care about them at all you wouldn't suffer the two are so interrelated that uh i think once you see that your joy being with that person is directly tied to later suffering the whole aspect of it becomes uh um, you, you just embrace both sides. I guess so. I think we choose. We choose what we, we choose our suffering to some extent. And, um, I think sometimes we think to ourselves, why on earth did I suffer for X or Y or Z? That wasn't necessary. I think we need to all choose, really. And meditation gives us I think one of the best ways to choose actively. I think we choose what we suffer. And the extent to which we can choose and what we suffer from in a way, because ultimately life is suffering, right? Um, the better and the more well-adjusted we'll be in our lives. Mm, I think we choose to suffer because we have a reason. If we wouldn't have one, if you know what I mean. I suppose. I mean, um... because like what I mean is, um, in my experience, like if if something is very, like if you haven't experienced it yet, and if it seems in your value and maybe spiritual or religious system to be of like, um, great importance, um, it becomes very hard uh, to, you know, uh, detach from that, you know. Um, I mean, there's certain things that we all share, um, and there are some things that are like personally uh, important to each and one, uh, each and one of us. So <clears throat> saying we can choose is, nah, I don't know, it, work, it doesn't work a hundred percent for me because um, we all have I mean... things that are of more value um, to us than other things to other people, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get but, stuck up on a relationship very badly, and some other person would say, like, yeah, fuck that bitch and move on, you know, yeah. because, yeah. And so, do I choose? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I just think it's important, and that's why I do it, I guess. It, it, the, I think the extent to which you can have choice is helpful, and you will be better adjusted if you, I mean, you don't want to suffer too much from your partner. I don't think it's. I don't think it's good. If, if someone tells you it's good that you suffer from your partner, I think they're lying to you. You know, um, and I'm just you know suffering too much from your partner. I think it's. I think they're lying to you. Um, I I know that relationships nearly inevitably have a negative aspect, but I was I'm not ask, going is to. Is there such thing as a relationship without suffering? I don't think so. No, no. I think I'd be very naive. Definitely not. And that's because um, we also care, though, right? Because if you didn't care, then you wouldn't suffer. Right. Yeah, sure. So I but think that's, that... That's a trade-off. Yeah, it's a trade-off. It's, that's just... It's a trade-off. But, you know, um, you can't... You, it's, all, it's yin yang at this. It's yin yang. It's a bit of both. You've got to have, got to have a bit of both, but not just one and not just the other, because it's not going to work. 
got to have a bit of both because that's what life is. That's what reality is. Yeah, and I think that's why when you embrace the void, you can't have just anger. You have to embrace the love too. You have to embrace the happiness and joy yeah. and the bright side of life because it is both. Shao says, both. my toothache is pain, reflecting on what a horrible thing it is to have a toothache is suffering. I suppose there are two different types in that way. Yeah, I mean, there are some forms of suffering that are very extremely difficult to withstand, and that isn't even on the. Physical. I don't know. That's Physical. that. You, yeah, that's something that's just sometimes too difficult, right? Um, Is suffering different from a state of mind? Like, yeah, no. Uh, we, we have different words, right? And we have we have all these different words for different kinds of negative states that we can be in, right? So. Yeah, I think it's just a word for a feeling, the way that anger is sort of a state of mind. It's just an emotion. But I think you could suffer while you're having different emotions, is my point there. So, like, if it's not a state of mind, then suffering is, like, separate from, like, the emotions we're having, having while we're suffering. That's a good question. Is anger suffering? I would say... Not um... No, not necessarily. You can enjoy your suffering, you can enjoy your anger. But I then think. it's still suffering even if you enjoy it. Well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, we, we're, we're messing with words at this stage. I mean, I, yeah, I said that. No, I don't think we are, actually. I think this is like a real, like a, yeah. like real state. Like, because people do suffer and are angry and enjoy the suffering. Like, that's, that's the point, yeah. That's exactly, if you enjoy your suffering, that's what it is, you're enjoying your suffering. So maybe you can have another word for that. You could call it catharsis, you could call it, I don't know, masochism, that's a term, right? <laughs> that's an actual term for it. Yeah, but masochism. you think it's, it's there's you're still suffering regardless? Well, it's my, I don't know, it's just masochism, isn't it? So it's just a word, you know? I don't well, know. that's my question, like, are you still I, I suffering know. regardless of if you're completely immersed in enjoying this suffering are you still what suffering like that's that what relates to amor fati right? you, you might you might yes. get the occasional yes, endorphin yes. rush yeah you might get the endorphin rush when and you then is it still it. suffering if you enjoy it like if you're amor I would, yeah i would say uh, that uh suffering is sort of rejecting uh you know what is rejecting what is happening reality so if you're if you're angry but you're oh. not rejecting that that you're just you're just there with it in it then suffering wouldn't occur but what where it could occur is after you after the anger is gone you may reflect and then have regret and then therefore you would be you would you would feel suffering that's a really good point i don't know this is this is this is interesting because... Well, if okay, we could make a situation where somebody could be angry and be suffering. Like, say somebody in their life normally suffers, so their normal state of mind is suffering, and then something occurs that makes them angry, right? And they're in the same state of mind, right? So even if they enjoyed the suffering, and we could say, say they're not suffering when they enjoy suffering, then that thing that makes them angry... Are they now suffering, even though they enjoy their suffering? Is anger this thing that now made them angry, not now them suffering? I mean, I can give you an example. Like, when I'm coding and I'm frustrated with a problem, I do kind of enjoy the frustration. Like, when I'm writing software and there's a really complicated bug and it takes me, like, I don't know, like half an hour to figure out how to solve it, that's an enjoying kind of suffering right mm -hmm. yeah mm. and that's you I using really love, that I suffering really that. to channel it into what you're doing whereas some people might get frustrated yeah. and they can't work anymore because they can't channel that energy of the frustration into the work yeah so right, i think yeah. this relates back to amor fati like the suffering we must like find enjoyment through it if it's pervasive like if it's passive and existent then we need to accept it and find the things we enjoy through it and push that will and direct it are we talking so about... as soon as you uh, accept it it sort of shifts it changes it it's you i don't think you could call it suffering i mean again it's these are just words but 
if you're taking the essence of the word suffering, well, we're, the essence is something not enjoyable. You are not, you do not want this thing. But if it is something that isn't, um, that you're not rejecting anymore, then I'm not sure you could call it suffering. Um, but I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Are we talking? Uh, about... I like. I think you're making a really good distinction, right? Uh, this is what the canonical, I think, interpretation of the term suffering is when it's unnecessary. And drawing that line is sometimes hard. Mm -hmm. but, and uh... Shao makes a difference between pain and suffering as well. And it does seem like there is a pain that happens, whether or not we choose it, and then additional pain, which is suffering, which we do yeah. impose upon ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think that even like somebody dying, you know, we, we say, oh, somebody dies and, and there's suffering there and you shouldn't, you know, if you weren't attached so deeply then, but the, I, I almost think that there's a, maybe a part of that, somebody dying that's close to you, that's not actually suffering, that's actually pain. It's like a, I don't know, that one's hard. I haven't experienced that, uh, yeah, so I can't really say. What if you're sad and you see that sadness of losing that person as beautiful and you love it because it is directly proportional to the joy that the person gave you? Um, you love it, but it is still pain. It's not physical pain, but it is mentally caused. I'm, I'm sort of split because I can see myself being like, ahead of time, yeah, I guess, in a way of setting myself up of going, I know this is going to happen. Things are impermanent. This is uh, the fate of everybody. Everybody will die eventually. And so like, I kind of feel like I could be like, yeah, I don't know if I would experience a deep level of suffering, um, but I, I'm not really sure. That's I mean, uh, not something I've I mean, tested yet. There are, I think there are different cultures who tackle the whole dying thing differently than we do mm -hmm. um, as sort of a celebration. Uh -huh. That would be um, an example. Um, what I'm trying to figure, figure out is like when we're talking about the word suffering, um, I mean, Shawi mentioned pain. And I guess you guys were talking about em like chosen emotional pain. Um, that's when we talked about having the choice, which is usually like an imposed thing or not, not an imposed thing, but like a thing we can change through our mindset. But then there is, um, suffering that, you know, can hardly be changed, quote unquote, to give an example, you could be like having fatal disease or something, uh, sitting in a wheelchair all day and, you know, uh, having quite some pain or. Um, your husband is beating you all the time and you can get, get out of this situation. And then the question really is like, um, is, is that the same kind of suffering? Um, would you, would you be free to choose a more positive mindset? I, I'd say yes. Definitely not. Like physical <laughs> pain? Definitely not. Physical pain and like an emotion, emotional pain. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to like disagree with you and you, you completely can like you know, make a point of what I'm saying. Um, but no, like physical pain is different. But like if you're having physical pain and then you're also on top of that going, you know, oh, I wish I wish this wasn't happening to me or this is uh, I wish, you know, something would take this away. You know, like there's this emotional pain that isn't necessary. Even, that even physical pain can be different though because uh, Sam Harris who we listened to at the beginning of this talks about the difference between the muscle burn after a workout which hurts the next day but it feels good because you had a workout whereas if you had the exact same physical feeling but it was caused by cancer it would be excruciating yeah yeah that's kind of true <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't compare cancer pain <laughs> with sore <laughs> muscles, but <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But if you had sore muscles and it was caused by cancer, and you knew that this was eating away at your muscles and you were going to die, it wouldn't yes. feel good in the way that your day after a workout muscle burn feels good. Yes. Uh, in, in I don't fact... know. Even from even from a medical perspective, I feel like that's somewhat incorrect. But okay. Um. <laughs> um. You know. 
Yeah, but uh, the, the the thing is, um... I mean, he is Sam Harris. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, like, um, uh, uh, like uh, the anticipation of pain can cause yeah. higher pain perception. Um, if I was to hold a knife and to announce me cutting you very deeply, you'd already be in a mindset of being hurt uh, very deeply. Um, and it yeah. would probably hurt more um, than if I just do it. I don't know if you're yeah, aware yeah. of that fact. Um, I, I, I am. But the thing is, okay, when it comes to this, I, will, I do think about this very precisely. And I don't know, maybe it's because of my masochist. But um, <laughs> when I think about this, I do think about this precisely. And uh, there are certain things like, you know, endorphin rushes that you get after pain. And that's why people do self-harm, by the way. And there are certain things like working out and you do get the endorphin rush. And the one and the things that you do, like with work, like you work hard, it's like, oh, you do get that satisfaction. Great. You know, um, I, I think that the, the, it's a very, maybe the term necessary is always coming up in my mind, right? How much of that's, this pain is necessary? Yeah. It's like, are you doing a cost benefit analysis on the things that you do? <laughs> <laughs> really and like you know and is it worth it ultimately yeah exactly that it's like is this worth it am i am i working out every day and is it not getting me anywhere or you know um am i investing too much time in this relationship but it's not make, giving me anything in return is it worth it um well if it's, i think it's worth it if it has meaning and i think that makes it more tolerable because if you have emotional pain, but there's meaning behind it that allows you to embrace and accept it, then it gives it a purpose and makes it not as bad as if you have pain that is senseless or has no meaning. Sure, yeah. I can agree with that. I'm trying to relate this back to Nietzsche because he talks so much about meaning. Right. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. Meaning is a, is a really important thing, and uh, purpose. Yeah, many of the things that we do, we do them because they are meaningful. We wouldn't do it otherwise, right? Um, you know, if I was keeping contact with someone that was giving me a headache, I'd be like, oh, how close is this person to me? Is this person part of a very special connection or group, or is this person just taking the piss? You know, it depends. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you doing things because they're meaningful. There's not there's not a better reason to do anything than it is meaningful, right? That's like one of the best reasons to do something. Um, yeah, I think this might go into how we channel all these negative emotions because we can probably see that there is suffering involved in anger and there's suffering involved in fear and these other emotions and. So it is kind of related in general, which is why we can sort of in general refer to it as the shadow self, which is what Jung did, or the void, which is what Nietzsche did. And if we can embrace and then channel that energy, it does give it meaning and it gives it purpose. And that means that your anger isn't something you want to avoid. You want to embrace it because you're using it towards a higher purpose, which is the formation of your own self yeah pressure so, creates diamond and we can do that with our sadness and our suffering we can harness and channel all of that energy i'm starting to maybe get the feeling that you know this definition of suffering may not be a really very clear um line that it can be a little um hazy a little uh, foggy not you know not to an, an extreme but and it, it sort of kind of comes down to like an individual person um it, it, it's still there yeah. there are still boundaries but not perfectly a perfect line it's a general term i think uh as is the word pain um according to the google dictionary it's the state of undergoing pain distress or hardship so it uh it's it's kind of a general term and that's why we can apply it to 
anger as well as sorrow, even though we wouldn't say that anger and sorrow are the same thing, but they both have aspects of suffering in them. Because there's, we're rejecting something about our reality as it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is sort of like the main basis, the foundation is like that, that rejecting of reality um, to quantify uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. Don't we do everything? Don't, okay. Here's a, here's a question. Isn't everything that we do, like, in some way motivated by that? You know, like, whenever yeah. I do something, or I, I clean, exactly, when I clean my room, when I do it, I'm like, no, the room should be tidy. So here we are. It's in one state. I make it yeah. tidy. And now it's, now it's clean. Hooray. Yeah, so. this is what Nietzsche calls the will to power. This is the will that drives us. This is why he was so frustrated with Christianity for rejecting all these negative emotions because he believed all of the impetus and drive of life came from this. Yay. And it's just that we have to harness it in the right way. When we're out of control with it, we can't harness that energy to improve our lives. So reacting out of anger is losing control. But if you can direct that energy into some goal or purpose in your life, then, yeah. then you are a real master of yourself. Then you are the Superman. Ubermensch. The Ubermensch. <laughs> I learned another German word. What, what word? Yeah, Richard Dawkins explains that well in his book, The Selfish Gene in a Biological Way. What does he say? Oh, yeah? Yeah, J just pretty much what Lauren said, but in a biological aspect. Uh, okay. I just wonder how so. Well, it's, it's, it's parallel to it. There's no point of going deep into it. Um, but to like, cut it short, it's just that, like, obviously humans, it's natural to seek stimulation and the selfish gene is just about, like, production. There's, like, no meaning. We just continue to look for stimulation. And I guess it's just the driving force of, of our beings in general. Okay, but, okay, the thing is, my understanding of selfish gene is maybe a little different because with the selfish gene, it's like our... He kind of takes the focus away from what we are psychologically and kind of rationalizes that, uh, you know, emergent successful genes just self-replicate. So the minute like, you... there's quotes in the selfish gene that talk about like, it is incredibly beneficial for individual species to be selfish in yeah. small scale events every time that over a long period of time, because when we aren't selfish in independent events, like, over time, those would die longer. So he was talking about, it seemed mostly, like, about why it is in us so prevalently and why it why we still use it and why it's still, like, an, like a useful tool in a way. Yeah, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um... I mean, okay, I understood that he thought that tit for tat, okay, he, he, there was an example that he used to show that human cooperation is actually, he, he thinks that his book, The Selfish Gene, doesn't talk about the selfishness of humans, okay? It's about the selfishness of the genes. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. So the genes yeah. are selfish. It's not that we are selfish, the genes are. So well, mostly, he and definitely we are a talks about of things. Our biology. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. but it's like he focuses it because you know, okay, when he wrote the book, he noticed that people made a lot of political and social claims about what he was saying, and he was actually annoyed to some extent because he thought it w people were trying to say that human human beings were selfish because he called it the selfish gene, but he said actually I shouldn't have called it the selfish gene; I should have called it the immortal gene. Right, because he was saying that it's not about human selfishness. Right, he emphasized. He thinks that the book actually emphasizes cooperation because if we were really selfish, my God, we wouldn't be doing anything like what we're doing now at all. You know, um, um, and the, the the book it talks about the perspective of the gene being oriented around itself. 
Right. Uh, that's the core. Yeah, well, I think now, it's that it? it benefits me to benefit everyone else. All You know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So it is selfish uh, to help others because it helps me too. Yeah. yeah. For, right, yeah, that's the thing. From an intellectual perspective, you have... No, like, it absolutely you know, talks about that in the book. I'm not... Yeah, I agree. Not, yeah, okay. But okay. Then, I, I'm very careful with words because sure. helping other people to help oneself, that's, you say, pain to experience pleasure. Or suffering that uh, cre uh, that you enjoy, you, yeah. you're using both of the words. <laughs> Do you understand? So, when you say such things, you have to. If you include it, it's opposite. It isn't. It's opposite. And you have and you've forgotten. You've uh, you're you're like in water, right? You don't realize that you're in water. So, yeah, I I say be careful with that because just when you literally say certain things. Like when you say, oh, I, I serve other people to help myself because I enjoy it. Why do you even enjoy it in the first place? Yeah. And the book certainly doesn't say things like that. It doesn't make grand statements about like society and individuals <laughs> like, like that. No. It more so talks about like either the cell and what the cell generally will end up doing. The cells are very simple and they end up doing the same thing normally. So you can, they're very predictable. And it crosses that over to other species occasionally, but it mostly talks about yeah, stuff. Yeah, so I, I can yeah. I can imagine why he why he would say because it is taken as mostly a political statement and not like a a biology. Yeah, which is which like, is very naive. It's, it's very naive yeah. to take it. But it it, it can be taken as like stuff that can be it, represented. It doesn't make any like, sense. It's, it's no, it's really... because like individual people are cells in a grand organism that's a society. No, they're not cells in a grand. Organism. No, 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 that's a metaphor. You have to. Yeah. Be okay. It is a. Okay. This. Yes. It is a metaphor, but it can be thought of that, and it represents the same way because people are made of cells. It's very loosely. Very, very if, loosely. If cells are the microcosm, right? If cells are the tiny if things that make up the macrocosm of us. I mean, cells are cells, and humans are humans. The different things. Um. Okay. Hang on. I want to try to relate the idea of selfishness back to Nietzsche. Um. Mm. Now, he would say that we need to reject any kind of ethical system that doesn't come from within us. And so, in a way, he would say you do want to build how you view your ethics and morality from within. Um, now, I'm not sure if that would result in selfishness, but it is certainly self-centered. Um, I think yeah. that if, if you really did become the ubermensch that he talks about, you would love the whole process of what was happening around you in reality, and therefore you would love everyone else, and you would love your suffering as well as your joy, and you would love your anger, and you would love whether or not other people treat you in every, any different way. So you might not be selfish because you would love other people as much as yourself. Yeah, I was going to say, this is like a perfect segue into how Nietzsche talks about um, morality and, and his view on that. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, he makes the morality so completely self-centered that you might see it as selfish. And certainly other dictators have taken Nietzsche as justification for, I'm going to create my own rules. Um but he emphasizes so much embracing and loving the dark and the negative and the angry and the suffering and uh, whatever happens to you, to love your fate and love what happens to you so that you wouldn't necessarily reject anything that happened, uh, whether it was the loss of someone you loved or losing your job or um, getting sick and dying. Um, and so... I think it would result in a more compassionate view of other people if you really did embrace everything. Yeah, I, I think it's sort of, um, this may not be the, the best words, but it sort of breaks down this, this notion or idea of like right and wrong in that it, it's hard to describe because we as a you know 
community as human race were not there yet but it's almost like that right and wrong or would be almost unnecessary um that's a really big statement but i don't know it makes sense to me yeah yeah i think so yeah. too go ahead and it is and it's because like people are so people should have an individual sense of like justice and right and wrong in their own minds and like it's the same with god is dead like it's not that like anything specific has died or hasn't died it's like this concept we're sharing needs to be abolished because we can all all care ourselves now same thing with abolishing right and wrong it's that like as a concept that we share, we shouldn't have right and wrong as a book and a rule and a thing like that. It should be up to the individual and up to what is just exactly. in the mind of people. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. And so Shao is uh, pointing out Nietzsche's book. One of his books is called Beyond Good and Evil, where he does go into this as well. And he says, we do have to go beyond these concepts in order to understand them and create a true value system that we can believe in that has meaning um Shao mentions this thing that is mentioned in one of these talks an apollonian versus dionysian concept so dionysus the god of uh wine and celebration and things he is representing the chaos and the dark and the apollonian god or concept is uh more order and foundation and rules and what Nietzsche wants us to do is to impose order upon our own chaos to delve into the chaos and the imposing of order is that channeling of energy um, and this is what makes us over the man that we are now a, a better version of ourselves psychologically uh, he even says a new dawn can only arise out of the darkness of the night Yeah, I think now how you would build that value system would involve embracing the darkness. Oh, goodness, I wonder. Should I read what Shao just said? Or do you guys just want to read it? Uh, you can read it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You desire to live according to nature. Oh, you noble Stoics, what fraud of words. Yeah, he didn't like the Stoics. Uh, imagine to yourselves as being like nature, boundlessly extravagant, boundlessly indifferent, without purpose or consideration, without pity or justice, at once fruitful and barren and uncertain. Imagine to yourselves indifference as a power. How could you live in accordance with such indifference? To live, is not that just endeavoring to be otherwise than this nature? Is not living, valuing, preferring, being unjust, being limited, endeavoring to be different. And granted that your imperative, living according to nature, means actually the same as living according to life, how could you do differently? Mm. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's fun. It's up to every person to decide that for themselves. If he doesn't give an answer, then it's because it's it should be decided for each individual. Like, he's not proposing that we come up with a new religion, like a new god or something to follow. It's up to each to find this new whatever, this mm -hmm. new uber minch. Yeah. And he believed we had to use a lot of culture to do that. We had to use our previous history, use philosophy, art, literature, um, to use all of the humanities because a lot of deep meaning comes from there and that's where we can find the answers to our own selves yeah. Um, but yeah he didn't like the Stoics he what is it he said about the Stoics I have this written down here he thought Stoicism was a denial of the will that we have within us the will to power and a denial of the world uh, he sent he thought Stoicism was too much fatalism um, well. and freedom is only internal in Stoicism, whereas Nietzsche thought we had to use the external world as well. I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, Stoicism often occurs during the collapse of a civilization, uh, and that people see the chaos around them on the outside and seek internal indifference. 
and that he didn't like internal indifference. He and he um he wanted that boundlessly extravagant. Um yeah. yeah, he wants chaos within. He wants the dancing star within you. Um he wants to appreciate both the Dionysian chaos part of existence as well as the Apollonian, to accept it and love it, to love time and self and its movements in history. Here's another quote. He who fights with monsters might take care, lest he thereby become a monster. And if you gaze for long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Yes, very famous quote. I actually, um, I love the Stoics, um, maybe in a strange way, maybe not in a in a way of like getting a. a a way of getting to where they're talking about, but the the actual place that they arrive at feels like it describes um, m most of my daily experience. Um, and you would have to kind of read read into stoicism, but I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to describe, but I there's reading and listening to like what they're um, practice or what they're attempting to do feels very much at like home for me it's not like um my experience isn't perfectly aligned with that but some of the things that they they talk about and sort of like and i don't know i maybe maybe possibly nietzsche might have had a bad view on what they're or a wrong possibly a wrong view on it because because what the stoicisms stoicisms uh, they, they are attempting they're putting themselves in chaos you know they're they're saying you know go into like put yourself into these these uh into positions to to bring up you know the fear and the um the uh, anger like it it's clearly says that so it's it's strange that he would um he would be like uh den almost denying them yeah i think um so shao says that nietzsche was a provocateur and he's right nietzsche considered himself a hammer coming down on uh modern society and trying to shake things up and so i think he was probably just rejecting the more surface concept of it which is a, a kind of gray indifference to things where you just accept nietzsche didn't want to just accept and that's part of the love thing he wanted to change things he wanted us to change ourselves um that means not accepting yourself as you are now. That means taking your anger and whatever emotion comes from that and using it to channel and fund into yourself so that you do become your better self. And that means a kind of malcontent with how you are now. And he thinks that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just from what I understand um from from this conversation and, and what i've you know what we were listening to from nietzsche and also i have a you know very basic understanding of stoicism it doesn't appear to be in conflict and it's, so it's kind of strange to hear that coming from uh from Nietzsche. yeah i think it's probably more similar than he was saying and he might have just been trying to appeal to um the more basic idea of it, the, the more surface level understanding. But I bet if we looked into Stoicism, we would see uh, more similarities. And so uh, Shao is pointing out, Stoicism is acknowledging that you can't control what the world throws at you, but you can control how you respond to that stimuli. Yeah, and like I was saying, Stoicism like encourages you to put yourself in positions um, that sort of make you a little uncomfortable sort of like you know shake you up to kind of get those those things those responses that you see so that you can see them clearly and and you sort of work through that so in a way i feel like it is almost like embracing this sort of chaos you know because you're, yes, you're um, intentionally pulling pulling it up stoicism does talk about like not um not uh feeling emotions too deeply right like you wouldn't want to feel anger in stoicism i don't 
think so. No, it's not. It's not denying. It's not denying uh, anything like that. Um, I would have to think about how to like put it into words. Let me just look it up real quick. Different Stoics have different expressions, yeah. though. Gareth, you're the expert here. Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius are totally different. Like Epictetus started off, you know, by being a slave, and I think he's the perfect example if you want to look into it deeply. But but when you're looking at the emperors, such as Marcus Aurelius, which is probably the most common and popular, he has different interpretations too. But then you can go further back, can't you, into Aristotle, Aristotle, um, Socrates, and whatnot. But I I don't know. It's it's very difficult and vast. I want to say that Epictetus yeah. was the Stoic that Nietzsche liked the most. Yeah, probably because of his background, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he uh, improved himself. Yeah. I can't remember now at the top of my head, but um, there was an example of, um, I know you were saying about embracing the chaos, but it was just to do with like the, the basics of life. Um, he's... Uh, one of the Stoics seen a man drink water with his hand, and one of the Stoics, he just used, he, just for general basic necessities, he had um, just like a metal pot and drank it, but he seen this poor person just drink the water with his hand, and then he got rid of the cup, and then decided to just, you know, then take water, but just drink it by his hands. Um, I, I don't know, would you say that's embracing chaos, or Seeking discomfort. materialism? Yeah, but uh, it's a rejection of it's, materialism. It's... Yeah, th- no, that's people are doing this today. I mean, look, what's his name? Wim Hof. Do you know Wim Hof? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's great. The breathing. Actually, he's the breathing guy, right? And you know, the yeah. breathing the ice man. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, this is really important. I mean, he says, "Let's go out into the woods and immerse ourselves in ice water, because mm. it's psychologically helpful, helpful, therapeutic." Okay, and um, you know. Who knows? You might be able to survive with less heating bills. Okay, that's kind of an extreme thing. But, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to you embrace discomfort. And even on the physiological level, that sort of comfort helps you. Yeah, it engages the fight and flight system. It, definitely, it, yeah. It reduces inflammation. It has, uh, it improves your mood. You know. Well, he's going to be doing that with Russell Brand, isn't he? He's taking, is he taking 30 guys up to Kilimanjaro? Um, and they're going to do, he's going to climb Kilimanjaro, like just in his, in his shots, take um, 30 people, and he's trying to um, convince Russell Brand to do it in one day. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I so think I, I, he's I, saying I, I, the power I, of the mindset. Yeah. 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 Um, I know he, he has a program. He's doing it with loads, he's done it with loads of people. But I didn't know he was doing the Russell Brand, so there you go. <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, no, no, he, he, he's trying to convince him. It's not confirmed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay. reading Stoicism and some of these basic tenets under Wikipedia, and it says here that um, the principle of virtue consists in a will that is in agreement with nature. It's varied, because when, when, you, when you look at the history of it, Lauren, it changes from, um, it's, it's dated, I guess, sort of like religion, you know? It just seems like one of the main goals is can to make be things free better or worse. of anger, to be free of envy and jealousy. Um, it seems like they consider the ultimate sage to have no emotional reactions like this to anything. Sounds practically impossible, but if someone's willing to try, I say go for it. You might uh, have to isolate yourself. I don't know who I was looking up, to be honest, but it, that doesn't sound like what what I was learning about it. It was not, it definitely wasn't to just become completely an unemotional mm. person. It yeah. was to, you, it was, it was, um, it's it was uh, putting yourself in, isn't it? what's that? It's apparently to get the most best balanced lifestyle possible. Yeah, like it you. was, it was more balanced and it was more about yeah. putting yourself in pos- a position to see how your mind would react to that situation and to see that so. you have some level of sort of control, but it wasn't saying that you shouldn't, or the goal was to not have any emotions. Like it definitely 
didn't seem that way. Apparently they use the word apatheia, which in the Greek is uh, literally without passion, which is what Epictetus says was the way to be free of suffering. I'm just from, this from what I'm reading on Wikipedia. I mean, okay, um, if you, what were the letters that Seneca and what's his name wrote? I forget his name. But I, I don't know. Marcus Aurelius. Marcus, yeah, Marcus Aurelius. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think these, I don't think anyone, I don't think they ever were completely a-emotional. That's just impossible. Um, I don't know. That's impossible. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I just started looking into it, so, like, I could totally be wrong. I yeah. will submit that I do not know that much. I don't know much about it either. They do talk about um, improving yourself morally and in terms of ethics, but um, it also seems like there is... Um... It, it's it's more down to control thoughts, I would say. Like, uh, my yeah. favorite quote from Aurelius is... Um, Quality of life is down to the quality of your thoughts. And they uh, install it into uh, elite athletes. I think the goal is to not be at the mercy of your emotions. Yeah. But there, they will still be there. Follow where reason leads. One must therefore strive to be free of passions, bearing in mind that the ancient meaning of passion was anguish or suffering. That is, passively reacting to external events, which is somewhat different from the modern use of the word. Yeah, that sounds a little more correct. Which was kind of like, n yeah, n not reacting, you know, without control. Mm -hmm. the, core, the four cardinal virtues of Stoic philosophy um, <clears throat> are wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. What do you think they meant by temperance? Well, we're getting more into stoicism now. I think we I'm probably, sorry. I think it's probably the temperance side of stoicism that Nietzsche was railing against. Um, we we can look into it more and compare the two. Actually, I think uh, if we do stoicism next time, it would be very easy to compare them since Nietzsche would be so fresh. Um, yeah, or or whatever you know, we can we can. Um, yeah. I mean, like Zen was saying, I, I see a large connection with uh, certain aspects of Stoicism. Yeah, it's funny that he explicitly rejects it so much. Um, I think that he, maybe the, maybe the main difference is that he emphasizes passion so much, whereas the Stoics probably wouldn't, where, and he considers it fundamental and necessary to self-improvement. Nietzsche was all about that passion, is what I'm trying to say, and you might say that the Stoics yeah. of all people were not. Yeah, I can see that. I can see how that. I mean, that is sort of what they they are representing By... is like um, the the not passion. <laughs> Stoicism, yeah. I was like thinking of uh, that. Maybe passion is used in a different context. Well, well, I can't really say that. I, I think it's the same context. And Nietzsche, I don't know if Nietzsche even believed in true peace of mind, because he considered the chaos side so uh, real. Okay, and that concludes our session on Nietzsche. Um, we kind of delved into other subjects that were unrelated and um, didn't really have an official ending, so I'm recording the ending here. Uh, we do these sessions every Sunday. I'm going to be uploading another one soon, and thank you for listening.